This morning, please, to Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah chapter number 53. <clears throat> if we go elsewhere in Scripture, we'll be in this chapter. Title of our message this morning is Understanding Isaiah 53. I'm going to preach as much of this as I can this morning as time allows and uh, I pray the Lord to give us an understanding of this great chapter. Beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. <clears throat> he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God, and I thank you this morning for people who are interested and believe the Word of God. And I pray you would help us this morning. I pray in Christ's name, amen. There was a professor at the Arlington Baptist College when Brother Dominic and I were students there, Dr. Raymond Barber. He used to call the book of Isaiah the gospel according to Isaiah. And in this particular chapter, Isaiah is given a prophetical vision of Jesus Christ and what he's going to go through in our redemption and in the crucifixion. So Isaiah, now understand as we go into this, we believe in the doctrine of verbal, plenary, divine inspiration. What that means is that God inspired every word, not thoughts. Now, there are some say that God just inspired thoughts and that human instruments put the words together. The terminology, believe that, I don't buy that. The Bible says every word of God is tried. All right, so I'm going to share with you in, in our lesson, in our outlines, 
just some one or two word phrases that we want to set up. First of all, unbelief and revelation. You notice not very many people believe the report. To this very day, still very few believe all that the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. A lot of them want the sweetness and the love and the mercy and all of that, but they don't want the required obedience. There's a lot of believing unbelief. It's just like in 2 Kings. I read this just recently. They feared God, yet worshipped their own ways. Worshipped other gods. They tried to have the fear of God and what they wanted to do. All at the same time. Kind of like what we have today. Designer churches. Whatever you want the church to be, whatever you want the Bible to say, whatever you want. I have a friend that said to me, he said, I, I need to get me a Bible, but, but I don't want one of those hellfire brimstone Bibles. You see. Who hath believed our report? But then the grace of this, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? There you have the doctrine of revelation. In Acts 16, you read about Lydia, it said, whose heart the Lord opened. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible says, but God commanded the light to shine in darkness. We were spiritually discerned. We would not, we could not understand that phrase in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. That phrase spiritually discerned means their judgment is all fouled up. We could not of our own will, of our own thinking, of our own initiative make right decisions about God, His Word, His Son, His house, and everything else. And so God commanded the light to shine in the darkness. He opened our eyes. He opened our hearts. He opened our ears. He opened our minds. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Secondly, a word we want to use in verse 2, verse two down to verse 4 is the word contempt. Contempt. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, what did Pilate say in, in presenting Jesus Christ to the mob? He said, behold your king. They said what? We have no king but Caesar. A bunch of Jews saying they had no king but Caesar. They could, Caesar could not, as a Gentile Roman, be king over Jews. Contempt for Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus Christ came, he did not, and, and Isaiah is seeing this prophetically. This is all to happen in the future, and Isaiah is writing about it. Jesus Christ did not come with all the pomp and circumstance of a king, all the royalty and all of, the, all of this. He came to die for sinners. He came to suffer for our sin. They had contempt for him. Charles Spurgeon said the cross was in fact the expression of the world's feelings for Jesus Christ. Remember again about the crucifixion. It was designed for the vilest, most perverse criminals that society had. It was designed as the most torturous death for the most worthy, vilest criminals. We're going to see that just in a moment. Contempt. Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You understand something, folks? We didn't love God. He loved us. 1 John, says, 1 John 4, verse 10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. I was knocking doors in Ohio one time with Brother Koenig. And we came to this one house and the lady said, Oh yeah, I've always loved Jesus Christ. That sounds good, but it just doesn't fit. In our sin, in your sin, I didn't and you didn't love Christ. 
God, when He saves us by His grace, He puts His love into our hearts. We love Him because He first loved us. So Isaiah is, is portraying for us the depravity, the contempt, the alienation, the foreignness that we have towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 says we were without God, without Christ, without hope in the world. Alienated strangers and aliens to the things of God. Thank God for His grace. Remember this, during the crucifixion, before the crucifixion and ever since, Christ had full knowledge of our contempt. He died on the cross he had full knowledge of how mankind felt about him. He wasn't there saying, why do they hate me so? Why do they hate me? He knew why. He knew our sin. Jeremiah says, uh, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10 says, I the Lord try the hearts. He knew that. Remember as he's praying in Gethsemane. He knows what's transpiring. He knows what's taking place. Now back to Isaiah 53, please. It says, verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs. Never studied out before this week this word surely. This word surely means in spite of it. In other words, nevertheless. In spite of our being, in spite of being despised and rejected of men, in spite of the fact that we had no, he, we saw no comeliness, no beauty in him, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In spite of the ill treatment, in spite of how he knew we felt about him. Beyond that, he loved us. And he bore our sins. That brings us thirdly to the vicarious imputation. I hope that doesn't sound overly theological. But we have to understand it that way. The word vicarious means not for his own sin. The Bible said he suffered for our sins. 1 Peter 3.18 He suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. How many have ever been blamed for something you didn't do? I don't know about you, but it doesn't go well with me. I've told you before, I worked framing houses. And I worked on the ground sawing when we got to the decking on some of these real fancy houses. You had to cut out a piece of, it just looked like a jigsaw puzzle piece sometimes out of a piece of plywood. They'd holler down to you a bunch of measurements. You had to write them down, cut that out. And then throw it up there to them. And those guys would nail it in. Well, they put that up there and they forgot to put a support piece under it. And another guy came walking along there and stepped on it. There was no support under it, so it gave way under him. Boy, the foreman came around the corner just cussing me for old Billy Heck. I said, let's stop right here now. I said, I'm working down here. Those guys up there, if they needed a, a two before, they should have told me that. I, he said, well, I had to cuss somebody. I said, well, don't cuss me. I, I didn't. Christ said nothing. Nothing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Vicarious imputa imputation means God imputed it to him. Psalm 32, Romans 8. Blessed are the man whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. God took our sin, put it on His Son, and punished Him accordingly. God took His righteousness and put it on us. Imputation. Then God makes the judicial declaration of justification. You see, He took our sins on Himself. The Bible says God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. We need to understand that. Uh, verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. One time when I was in Ohio, I'd gone to the grocery store one night and I saw a very elderly man 
trying to carry this big box of apples. I don't know why he bought so many apples, but he had this great big box of, of apples. And I watched him a few steps, and that box was getting closer and closer to the ground. I knew he wasn't going to make it to the car. So I put my stuff in there. I went over there and said, I don't want to get in your way, but can I help you with that? And he was glad enough to let me. I took that box of apples, carried them to the man's car, put them in there. I don't know how he got them out when he got home. That's none of my business. But anyway, I took that burden. Imagine all of God's people down through history and all of their sin. Hebrews 2.9, Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. God, made, this phrase, laid on him. It means God made him encounter our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You wonder why he was oppressed and he was afflicted and why he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Imagine that burden being put on him. Just wait and wait and wait and wait and more weight and more burden and more burden. He's praying in Gethsemane and the Bible says he is perspiring, he's sweating great drops of blood. Why? Because God is making him encounter our sin. God laid on him the iniquity of us all understanding this great chapter. The Bible says God put him to grief. This word grief here just is not just sadness, sorrow that in time you get up. This is a sickening grief. This is a grief that makes you sick. Uh, it, this is, this, if you study, the, it, this is worse than the, uh, losing a child. This is the grief of being the sinless son of God and then, it's beyond our comprehension, being the sinless son of God and then being made sinner. Again, Hebrews 2, 9, he tasted death for every man. He tasted the death every man deserves. He tasted the death that every form of sin calls for. Imagine the vilest, most corrupt, sinful, whatever monster you might could imagine. Jesus Christ was made to encounter that. He laid on him the iniquity. Now the word iniquity means the perversion. God help us to read the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Hosea and read of some of the nauseating, immoral perversion that God likens our sin to be. See, Vicarious imputation. Surely, in spite of being rejected by us, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. The sorrow caused by sin. How many a mother's had her heart broken by a wayward son or a wayward daughter or a drunk, brutal, no account husband or how many a husband's been broken hearted by the a wayward wife. Why does God tell Hosea, go out and marry this harlot? He's trying to picture for you and for me the immorality and the perversion of our sin. That's what that word iniquity means. Transgression is our violation against God's holy law, our criminal acts against 
God. God put him to grief. You read over there in verse 10. He shall see the travail of his soul. Talking about sorrow here. You have the innocent son of God. He, here's, you have to remember something. Something here that we, we, humanity can't rationalize this. We can't figure this out. He's a man on the cross. He's God, but he's a man. It's a miracle. It can't be explained in the virgin birth, the resurrection. Absolute forgiveness. These are doctrines of revelation. God reveals them to our hearts. He enables us miraculously to believe them. Or we would think that it is foolishness. 1 Corinthians, the foolishness of the cross. You see, he had no sin of his own. He knew no sin. Notice, fourthly, the grace, sovereign grace. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. God did this. You understand in the crucifixion, Isaiah is writing, he's picturing this hundreds of years before it happens. God's not in heaven saying, what are they doing to my son? God designed all of that. God's not like some, some father uh, uh, afraid. Christopher played basketball, our oldest son played basketball at the Arlington Baptist College. And I went to a game, they played a school from up in Missouri. And uh, not a dramatic story, this is the truth. The team from Missouri had two seven-footers and a guy six-foot-ten on the court at the same, same time. And the tallest guy on, on the Arlington Baptist College team was about 6'4". And I said, to, and there's Christopher out there at 5'9". He could jump like a gazelle, but it didn't matter if the guys are that tall. So I says to Joel, I said, get ready to get embarrassed. I said, because if they hurt him, we were in the stands. And I said to, Chris, to Joel, get ready to get embarrassed because if they hurt him, I'm going out there. I don't care what. Didn't happen. But craziness trying to illustrate the fact God knew what's going on in the crucifixion. God designed it. Isaiah 2, 28. Uh, Isaiah, I mean, Acts 2, 27, 28. And Acts chapter 4 and verse 23, you'll read that all that took place in the crucifixion was at the hands of God. He did it. The grace of God. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put, you get that? He put Christ to a sickening grief. What do you mean by sickening? He was made physically sick. Some writers say they make us to think we don't know what transpired, what's trans what transpired, sorry. In the crucifixion, Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It says, By his stripes we are healed. Healed of what? All the diseases of sin. We don't know what, what physical infirmities and sicknesses came on Christ all at the same time as a result of being made every form of sin. Some say he died of a broken heart. He breathed out his breath. He said, it is finished and gave up the ghost. We don't know. He said in Psalm 22 that all of his bones were out of joint. Read that. I've jammed a finger or thumb a few times. I saw a fellow's shoulder get pulled out of socket one time. Ooh, ooh. Went to school, college with a guy that could pull his wrist out of socket. He could work it up in a Coke machine, 
turn his wrist all the way around, work it up in a Coke machine, pull cans of pop out at the Arlington Baptist College. <laughs> Brother Don may know him, may remember him. Old Brent Kingston, the midget. Literally. No, I don't mean that insulting. He was a, a midget, but he could pull his wrist out of socket and work it up in a Coke machine and pull drinks out. Sin. Jesus, the Bible said of Jesus, Psalm 22, all of his bones were out of socket. That's divine inspiration. It's not just a dramatic story getting more dramatic. That happened! None of his bones were broken, but Psalm 22, 14, they were out, pulled out of socket. Notice now verse 6. All we like sheep have gone. The word I want to use now is the word lost. All we like sheep have gone astray. Irretrievably. And just take a wrong turn and you turn around and go back. It's gone. It's lost. And all of these years... They never have raised up the Titanic. It's lost. I read the other day a number of the ships sunk in Pearl Harbor were raised, refurbished, repaired, and put in the conflict of World War II. The Japanese had no idea how industrious this country was. But anyway, those ships weren't lost. They were for a little while, but then they were, the Titanic's gone. We were lost. We were gone astray. Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to God us. Hmm? He came to Houston. After me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned willfully, intentionally, and purposefully. We were lost, gone astray, strangers, aliens, incapable of return, fallen. Romans, uh, Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't ever stop that at just all have sinned. Sure, we've sinned. Everybody, oh yeah, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. But they don't, they don't follow that up with the second part of that verse that says we are an affront, a dismal failure to the glory of God. You see, the Bible says we're, we were created, Revelation 4.11, we were created for God's glory. In our willful, intentional going astray, we have departed from God's glory. We've turned our back on it, gone. All we like sheep have gone astray, irretrievably lost. Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore in loving kindness have I drawn thee. You know what that word drawn means? <laughs> I wasn't coming. He drew me. John 6 says, No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. They were driven from the Lord's presence. They were driven from the garden. You ever wonder why they didn't turn around and try to go back? They didn't want to. They were opposed to that in their sin. In our sin. Lost. There's a song that says, In loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. From the depths of sin and shame, in love he ransomed me. Here's another thought, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Oppressed 
oppressed, oppressed by God, oppressed by the burden of sin, afflicted with the, the disease, the weight, the burden of sin. Incredible silence. Incredible silence. He opened not his mouth. He wasn't screaming, crying out, bellowing and wailing in pain. The Bible said he opened not his mouth. This was a great trouble to Pilate. He's puzzled by this. Pilate said, answers thou nothing? Look here, did you have something to say in defense? Aren't you going to defend yourself? Pilate could tell all of their Jewish their whole problem was jealousy. Read it in Matthew 27. It's all jealousy. Pilate says, answers thou nothing? The Bible said he opened not his mouth. Very quickly, justice and punishment. Isaiah 4 and 53, 4 and 5. He hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded. Now this word wounded means bruised and crushed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment that purchased our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, this stripes the black and blue bruises, we are healed of the disease of sin. The nauseous, in, in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, what is sin likened to? Leprosy. Oh, we just, isn't it something these days? You find some guy's got this problem with violence, problems with a bad temper, problem with drugs, problem with this and that, and he says, I'm, I've got a sickness, I need help. And that's something. Well, we've got a Savior that died for that sickness. He endured that sickness. He became that sin. By His stripes, we are healed. Verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. God put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Hebrews 9, 26, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The wrath of God, the justice of God is satisfied. It's done. The penalty has been paid. Our sins have been paid for. Completion and satisfaction. By his stripes, we are healed. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. You read in the Old Testament of the drink offerings. He was poured out unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. The Bible says he ever liveth, maketh intercession for the saints. You see, he went through all of this suffering. Up from the grave he arose. He arose with a mighty triumph or his foes. He arose. He arose a victor or the dark domain, and lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Isaiah takes us through the Son of God, the sovereignty of God in executing him, the justice of God, the wrath of God, the love of God, the pain, the suffering, the sickness. And it was vicarious. It was for our sin, not for his own. Hope you better understand Isaiah chapter 53. Let's stand together, please. Ask Brother Colt to come.
We're going to turn to page 590. 